Jens is the Edwin A. and Betty L. Bergman Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago Harris School of Policy. He is also the Faculty Director of the University of Chicago Crime Lab and the Co-Director of the Education Lab. He serves on the editorial board of the American Economic Review and is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine um, of the National Academy of Science. And he is going to provide opening comments and present a state of, present on the state of crime in Chicago. And the the panel will start. Um, as I said earlier, Jens is the co he's the director of the crime lab. He is also my boss, and he's a great ping pong player. Um, not saying that just because he's my boss. So, welcome, Jens. Great. Uh <clears throat> Thanks, everybody, for, uh, for coming to talk about what I think is uh, arguably the most important policy problem facing the city of Chicago, and not just the city of Chicago, cities all across the United States. I think when you, um, when you live here in the city of Chicago, I, as I think most people here probably do, you um, get used to seeing the steady drumbeat of news stories about the crime and violence problem over and over again. And we're used to seeing so many numbers in the, in the news media and on television. I think it's really important to keep in mind that every one of the numbers that we see here is a life. Every one of these lives matter, and every one of these lives is connected to a family that is now permanently damaged and will never be the same. We have tragedies like this far too often in the city of Chicago, but not just Chicago. So if you, here's a look around the, a look around the country. Now, uh, a lot of people compare homicides and compare the gun violence problem across different cities in the United States, uh, looking at total homicides, which I think isn't necessarily the most helpful way to uh, think about comparing cities because the cities are so different in size. I think it's much more helpful to compare cities in terms of something like homicides per capita or murders per capita. And what you can see is that there are a bunch of cities that have much lower murder rates per capita than Chicago. But even the safest cities in the United States, places like New York and LA, have homicide rates that would be shocking if you saw something like that in the affluent parts of Europe or Asia, right? They, Places like LA and New York only seem safe by the very unique standards that we have here in the United States around this problem. You can see that there are also many cities here in the United States that have homicide rates that are dramatically higher than what we have here in Chicago as well. On the order of things that you only see in low-income developing countries in places like Central America and South America. Um, so even though the homicide problem is not unique to Chicago, we are right now in a very unusual historical moment in history here in Chicago and in the United States. So this is a graph that shows you homicide rates per capita for three cities that we often compare in thinking about crime. Um, this is Chicago in red, Los Angeles in blue, and New York City is in green. And what we're showing you here is the murder rate per capita going all the way back to the, early, uh, to the late 1880s. So this is a 140-year look at a homicide in these three cities. I think that there are really two striking things about this graph. So the first thing is these are uh, obviously dramatically different cities, and yet, and yet, when you look back over this 140-year period, I think what's so striking about this graph is that the homicide rates per capita are so similar for most of this time period, despite the incredible differences in geography and population density and location and everything else. The second thing that I think is really so striking about this graph is that there are two exceptions to that similarity in homicide rates. One of those exceptions is in the 1920s during the Prohibition era, and the only other period over this 140-year window where Chicago looks dramatically different from New York and LA in terms of their homicide rates is right now. So as we're entering, entering a new mayoral administration, as we're entering a new gubernatorial administration, I think it is really important to keep in mind that what is going on now is really, in many ways, very unusual, historically speaking. Um, 
If you live in Chicago, you are also very aware that this problem is not evenly distributed across the city. We see gun violence, we see homicides, we see shootings very disproportionately concentrated on the south side of the city and on the, especially on the west side of the city as well. Now, if you live in Chicago, you realize these are also the neighborhoods that are the most economically segregated and racially segregated. That fact, combined with the patterning of gun violence in the city of Chicago, leads to massive disparities in homicide rate, homicide victimization rates by race and ethnicity in the United States, so especially among men. So this shows you homicide rates per 100,000 people for black men, Hispanic men, and white men in the prime victimization ages of 15 to 24. Here's a different way to think about this. So we spend a lot of time in public health thinking about life expectancy disparities and how to address it. And we talk about things like disease management, improving access to health care, uh, addressing food deserts. One of the major drivers of disparities in life expectancy in the United States right now is gun violence, is homicide. This is not just a public safety problem. This is a public health crisis that we have in Chicago and in cities all across the United States. Um, I think in many ways this is also a problem that uh, in many ways could be thought of as an existential or potential existential threat to the future of the city of Chicago as a whole. So here's a, let me talk you through this, uh, this graph. This shows you the population for New York, Chicago, and Detroit, um, where in each year we're dividing the city's population by its 1950 population. Okay, so this is showing you population changes going back to 1950. What you can see is New York is the top bar here. In the 1980s, New York City had lost about 10% of its 1950 population, and then New York City rebounded over time, due in part to the dramatic decrease in homicides we've seen. Compare that to the experience of Detroit, which since 1950 has lost over two-thirds of its population. Okay. Now, where does Chicago fall on this list? Chicago is almost exactly in the middle of New, York City, of New York City's experience and Detroit's experience. I think in many ways, one of the most critical questions that we have for the city of Chicago right now is which direction we are going to be going moving forward. Now, the good news, I think the good news about this problem is that it is not an inevitable part of urban life, right? So one way we can see that is the dramatic drop that we've seen in homicide rates in Los Angeles and New York compared to Chicago. That shows you that you don't have to be an American city with Chicago level rates of homicide right now, okay? And I think the other thing that we're uh, starting to see that's encouraging is an accumulating body of evidence from data science and social science highlighting effective strategies to address the violence problem. Things like increased school funding, targeted social services to those people at highest risk of uh, homicide involvement, uh, summer jobs for teenagers, uh, even things like hiring additional police and putting them in the highest crime neighborhoods. These are all things where we see in the data that they're promising strategies to addressing gun violence. Here's the challenge with these strategies. Each one, of these, uh, each one of these strategies for which we have some evidence are enormously expensive, right? So if you were gonna sit down, if you were the new mayor and you were trying to come up with a plan for what it would take to get the homicide rate in Chicago anywhere in the ballpark of what you see in New York City or Los Angeles right now, you should be thinking about writing a check that is well into the nine figures, well into the nine figures. Um, additional resources are also going to be required for one of the other key public safety or criminal justice challenges that we have here in Chicago, which is addressing the consent decree or carrying out the consent decree with the Chicago Police Department. So, you know, I think as most people in this room know, the consent decree with the Chicago Police Department adds a bunch of additional regulations and uh, requirements of the police department, but the other thing that it does is it includes a bunch of investments in the department, things like increasing the number of supervisors, providing additional mental health supports, 
for police officers. Why were those things recommendations of the Police Accountability Task Force and the Department of Justice Civil Rights investigation of the Chicago Police Department? Here's one answer to that question. When you look at homicide rates for Chicago police officers, they are fully 60% higher than what you see for the national average police, police department in the US. There is something deeply broken right now at the Chicago Police Department that is not serving the people who live in Chicago well and it's not serving the police officers themselves well either. So this also is going to be, this is gonna be something like a eight figure check, well into the eight figures that we should be thinking about. So this raises, I think, uh, a final question for, uh, this raises a final question for uh, the city of Chicago, which is where the resource is gonna come from. So I, uh, I recently discovered that there are these uh, websites online that let you do a little calculation that says, you know, if I live in Chicago and I have a certain amount of income, what am I paying in taxes right now? And what would that be if I moved somewhere else. I can't quite remember why I was on this website. I think it might have been sometime around the polar vortex. <laughs> and here's what you see when you go through that exercise, right? So imagine that you're a household of four people and your income is at the poverty level in Chicago. That's $25,000 for a family of four. And you ask yourself, what are my taxes in Chicago and how does that compare to what it would be in New York City? if I lived in New York City instead. And what you see, what you see is that if you're living in Chicago at the bottom of the income distribution, your tax is all in. Property tax, sales tax, income tax, all in here in Chicago at the bottom of the income distribution is roughly speaking 15% higher than if you lived in New York. Now ask yourself, how does that calculation change if you're closer to the top of the income distribution, you're a family of four making $150,000 a year. If you're making $150,000 a year and you live in Chicago instead of New York, you're paying about 15% less tax than you would if you're in New York. Or put differently, put differently, we are living in a city right now where rich people get a tax break and poor people get a public health crisis. And I think the question that we have to ask ourselves, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, is that the sort of city and the sort of country that we wanna be living in? I think the panel discussion that we're gonna have next is all about if we can come up with the resources to address this problem, what, what are the most constructive steps that we can take to make progress on this? Thank you very much. <laughs>